Hello, welcome back again. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I hope that everyone's had a great week, had a, a, a great start to this week, had a, a great weekend before that as well. Um, you know, one of the things uh, that we get exposed to a lot um, is, is bias. Um, we, we take kind of some active steps to try and, and acknowledge it and confront it and deal with it as much as possible, but we're only human. Um, so we end up not recognizing all of the biases that we have and sometimes making mistakes uh, without even knowing that we are making those mistakes. Um, so today I'm joined with uh, May again, who's our head of data science here at Searchy. And we're gonna be talking about all things bias, or at least as much as we can cover about bias, which is a huge, huge, huge conversation uh, and huge topic. So we're going to try and cover as much as we can and share as much knowledge as we can with you about the different types of biases, how they're relevant, how they affect us in our day-to-day -day lives in the next hour. Yeah. So. Hi, everyone. Doing, yes, I'm good. Um, so yeah, this is a very interesting topic and it's, uh, it's so big that uh, I think we're going to cover just few parts of it. Yeah. It's uh, a lot of research has been made there. And uh, so yeah, let's start from the beginning. Um, so I believe and studies have shown that we were born biased. We are <laughs> wired biased. And this is not, um, it shouldn't be, it's not a very bad thing. Because um, so the human the human has acquired this mechanism of uh, categorizing uh, uh, creatures, situations, human beings into favorable and unfavorable, and uh, in dangerous decision and dangerous situations um, where the time is the essence, mm -hmm. uh, the visual cues that we develop uh, are are. Uh, uh, the, the survival Our, mechanisms, yeah, right? The, exactly, exactly. So when you see a snake, even if it's an unvenomous one, mm. you would just run away from it. So it is safer to make those false positives, avoiding uh, mm. avoiding good things, uh, than than uh, having like uh, than than non avoiding uh, uh, the bad stuff. Okay. So your take on the argument, if I'm correct is that uh, we are born biased. Yes. That we are kind of genetically programmed in our brains to lean into bias. And that that is something that we have evolved to do over tens of thousands of years, 50,000 years, whatever it is. Um, don't want to get into a fight with any anyone about how long human <laughs> beings have existed for. Um, so however old it is. Um, so we've evolved over that time as a protection mechanism yes. to be biased. So, okay, what, what evidence is there that leads you to that? So there is the, this research, uh, friend, if we can get the video on the documentary, that shows that we, the, we, we are born by it. This is the Infant Cognition uh, the, the Center at Yale uh, the, University, the otherwise known lab, as the Baby Lab. Parents bring their children so here to unlock the now, mystery uh, of what they're well. thinking. Yeah, 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 sure. The Baby Whisperer is Dr. Karen Wynn. Cool. She and her team of researchers believe knowing good from bad so isn't learned. Yeah, We're so all actually now, born so with so those instincts. Up this the curtain. We watched babies as they were presented with a puppet show. Here, a puppet struggles to open a box. First, we see a green bunny who comes along and helps to open the box. Good behavior, good bunny. 
Then we see an orange bunny slam the box shut and run away. So it's bad behavior, bad no, bunny. I'm, I'm when given a choice between be the two, more than 80% of six-month-old babies play. chose the good bunny. Okay. And for those just three months old, um, it goes to almost 90%. Okay? Uh, so if babies know the difference uh, between good and bad, what else do they know? The Researchers one here one say one very one young one babies one very one clearly one like people who are similar to them. Thank you. Oh, that's so nice of you. And dislike those who may be different. But we're not talking about physical differences here. We're talking about differences of opinion. Think of it like people in the same political party or rooting for the same sports team. For Berkeley and Parker, it's simpler. Do you like Cheerios or do you like graham crackers? Which one would you like? Berkeley chooses a graham cracker. Then she watches as a gray cat and an orange cat are presented with the same choice. The orange cat chooses the same as Berkeley. I like graham crackers. The gray cat chooses differently. Ew, yuck, I don't like graham crackers. So which cat does Berkeley gravitate towards? You guessed it, the orange one. Okay. <laughs> the one who shares her opinion. So that's the idea like that, that Berkeley gravitates to Right, to exactly. the, the, the doll that's similar. To, to the like-minded puppet. Uh-huh, and away from the, the from the puppet that had the different opinions from her. And is that something that's learned, or is that just something innate? Well, uh, we've found this in babies as young as seven months of age. Uh, I think it's um, just a natural aspect of human nature that we're built to judge, you know, in what ways is this individual uh, like me, and in what ways are they different from me. Parker also chooses a graham cracker, but the orange cat chooses differently from him. Ew, yuck, I don't like graham crackers. Now watch what happens as Parker sees the orange cat struggling to open a box. The yellow puppy is nice to the cat. The blue puppy, blue puppy's bad behavior. Parker likes the mean one. So it's, it's, it's almost that he wants to punish those who don't have the same opinion as him? What we find over and over again is that babies will choose the individual who is actually mean to the one who had the different opinion from themselves. We, it seems that we're at a deep level built to, to not like individuals who are different from ourselves and to prefer those who are similar to us. What, is that, what does that tell you? I mean, is that depressing? Is that, is that <laughs> I think it's, you know, I think there's a lot of reasons why we might be built to orient towards others who are similar to us, to want to hang out with them and conglomerate with them. Yeah. 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 Uh, you could think of it as, you know, how the, how the first special interest groups get formed, mm -hmm. right? In the same scenario, more than 80% of babies under a year old choose the mean guy. And with babies around Parker's age, a little over one year old, 100% of them prefer the mean guy. So is this, does this mean that bias is inherent, that bias is sort of built into us? I, I think it does mean, I mean, we're biased to others who share our opinions or are similar to us in key ways. Um, and, and I guess to try to spin the, you know, the positive is if we're built to dislike differences, we're built to like similarities, it's, it's remembering that someone is like us in some way that gives us the, the connection to mm -hmm. them. We've seen babies express positive feelings, liking good behavior and rewarding good behavior. And we've seen them express not so positive feelings by discriminating against others. So what do these studies mean in the long term? Karen Wynn and her team at Yale hope that by studying these innate feelings of babies, we can all learn where our moral beliefs come from. Anderson Cooper, CNN, New Haven, Connecticut. Super powerful. Um, so talk me through what you understand from, from this case study. It's interesting how we develop um, this kind of prejudice or bias mm. from our early year, years, now, early months. Yeah. Uh, so we are in favor with others who share the same opinion. Uh, that is 100% a confirmation yeah, bias thing. Yes. Yeah. So uh, it's interesting how, how we develop it uh, mm. at this early stage. Um, I, I, I kind of, so I buy into what you're saying about kind of pattern recognition and it being a survival mechanism. Um, but there are so many other kinds of biases that don't necessarily they don't lean into, 
being clearly defined or described as a, a, a mechanism for survival. So we talk a lot about, in, in the recruitment space specifically, there are two major biases at play. You've got the confirmation bias, which is, I knew that person was amazing. I said it right from the beginning. You're not really looking to see if they're amazing. What you're looking for is any kind of signal that you can use to reinforce your decision. Um, so you're looking for signals that confirm your, your initial kind of assessment. Um, and then the second is uh, the halo yeah. effect. So this, this halo effect is an interesting one in relation to what we were describing just now uh, in terms of kind of how its uh, uh, biases often or can be created for as a survival mechanism or described as a survival mechanism. Because the halo effect has got absolutely, I, I can't see how it could be defined as a survival thing. So for those that aren't familiar with the halo effect, it's basically um, a bias which effectively says, uh, or the way it's described, is that people who look better, who sound smarter, who sound better, will be perceived as being better at something. Um, so there are some, some famous examples of, of this halo effect. Um, there's in, for anyone out there that's watching that's seen or read uh, Moneyball, it was at play in a very big way in, 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 that, in that story. Um, so the idea of pre-Moneyball was that uh, you had to look a certain way to be good at baseball. Right? You had to be tall, you had to have long arms, you had to run a certain way, you had to hit a certain way. And if you did all of those things, or you looked like you could do all of those things, then the recruiters for these baseball teams were more likely to suggest that you were really good at something, or really good at baseball. But if you didn't look the same way, if you didn't look the right way, they were more likely to grade you down. Um, and this happens all the time. So we, we tend to elect leaders who we think look like leaders. They're attractive, taller, uh, look smarter, dress better. Um, and I can't see so much how that is directly related to survival. Yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of a lot of those different biases, right? So yeah, so there there are different biases, but um, those those factors that you've just mentioned um, are just evolved they evolved on how the community perceived so mm. what makes something better than another is a complete perception, right? Uh, so it's how the, the people want to fit in, they want to see people fitting in so that they are perceived as being better. So, uh, so perhaps it's not just you're born with it, it's also a thing that you learn, exactly, right? Exactly, yeah. That's, so then how do, we, how do we get around these problems? How do we find routes to be less afflicted by bias? So let's, let's talk about uh, first about the, how, this, how these factors can affect, uh, affect our decisions, mm. how it can affect okay. the, the workspace uh, divisions that we already have. Uh, there, there is the, the obvious ones, the, the, the gender bias, the ethnic group bias. Uh, uh, Fran, if we can put, uh, put, put on screen the, the eBay auction, uh, uh, there was this study where uh, uh, there were uh, um, two auctions on, on eBay. Uh, both of them were showing the same exact products, uh, baseball cards. Uh, one of they the were baseball cards yeah, as well. Yeah. And I gave a baseball example. So baseball seems to be a popular subject. Yeah. So uh, the difference, the the only difference between the two auctions is that one was uh, the cards were held by uh, 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 African Americans or black skinned uh, hands. So this is and the, the case other study was, that we're talking yes, about here. Yes, and right? the other was uh, held with uh, with white hands. And the ones with the black hands got le uh, 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 got um, bids twenty percent less than the white hands. So Just this, by virtue this of the is hand how bias out. the ethnic group uh, ethnicity bias would would uh, would affect like uh, 
uh, your decision uh, on bidding and mm. and, 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 and in sales. Uh, while in workspace, if we can show a friend, if we can show the... Um, the Fago example, uh, or the gaffer. Sorry? The Google, Amazon, Facebook. Yeah, 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 the tech company's uh, distribution. Now, with the, with the gender bias, uh, how the, the workspace is divided. Hmm. Till now, till now, we are facing problems with the gender distribution in tech companies. Hmm. Uh, and uh, how, how, the, how jobs are, are being assigned to, to, to genders. There's, yeah. there, there's some jobs are still... Um, uh, being considered based as, on gender. As a female job or a male job. Yeah. Developers, scientists, engineers are all in the male, in the male area. It's crazy, right? And I think this, so this is, for anyone that's watching that thinks that this is, you know, under control, this is still a conversation which is happening at the moment. Um, so Saika, one of our, our founding uh, team members here, is currently in Silicon Valley. And she's been with some very large companies that are in this list. Um, and they have been explaining uh, the challenges that they've been facing with diversity and gender uh, and diversity across the board, uh, particularly from their hiring managers. So even though they're cognizant of it, they're still battling with identifying a solution to that particular problem. And I don't think it's going away anytime soon. So yeah, uh, our data <laughs> and our, uh, uh, our present now is, is biased. And now that we are training our machines to take decisions for us, there are uh, uh, like Compass is an algorithmic uh, mm, yes. machine learning uh, 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 models that can decide on whether a prisoner or how long a prisoner will t will stay in jail is. Uh, as a sentencing tool, so uh, sentencing it wasn't originally designed as a sentencing tool, but I believe it ended up being used as one yeah. uh, in the states. And obviously, it's the, the thing with machine learning is it learns from what it's taught. And exactly. if we're inherently biased in the data that we're feeding it, then, or in our processes, or in the things that we do as a society already, then it, the machines are going to learn in this kind of echo chamber yes. of, oh, let's all be biased and lean in this direction. So our historic data <coughs> is biased, and so our machine learning models are getting biased. Uh, but there is some good news. Mm-hmm. Okay. Tell me. Do you, do you want to talk about that graph? Like, uh, uh, yeah, that? I think we uh, we've mentioned it about the the the, the gender yeah, graph. Yeah, we didn't show it. Because it's gonna display now. Yeah. Also. Yeah, something's cracked. Yeah, we're cool. So, um, yeah. Okay. So where where have we got to, Fran? That's cool. If you talk about it, it's cool. Okay. So we've got the... There are certain jobs which historically have been kind of offered or there have been more opportunities for, for women than men, right? So you mentioned the software engineering part for men, and that's a really clear example. But then we've got uh, other examples on the counter side of that. So you've got, like, here we can see this. Uh, the, it's the this historic chart, right? distribution from the 60s till the, till I think it was a study into 2014. Mm. Mm. Um. Yeah, it's pretty crazy, right? To see that there are certain distributions of jobs, certain jobs which are more heavily distributed towards either gender. Um, and I don't. I, I see what Himesh, I see what you're saying over there, buddy, about um, the job distribution being valid because both ethnic groups have not had the same opportunities at education. I, I, I agree with that, but I agree with that 50 years ago, and I don't necessarily agree so much anymore. I, th I feel that there are education opportunities which exist online, which are accessible to people with an internet connection. Um, you know, mobile devices with internet connectivity or internet connection are more prevalent than drinking water across the world at the moment. So I d I'm not entirely convinced uh, by, by that argument so much anymore. I think that we're getting to a stage where gender, race, etc., they become less 
of a barrier to education, which should make it less of a barrier to opportunity. I think more and more frequently at the moment that the issues we face from a, a, an AI or a machine learning perspective, as well as from in society, they boil down, for me at least, they boil down to these inherent biases that we have. Um, and I, I don't know that we need to be perfect, but I do feel that there's room for us to improve. And I think with machine learning, and I kind of like your take on this, is with machine learning we have an opportunity to exponentially improve by identifying some of these biases and then not teaching those biases to a machine. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. I agree with that. Um, so imagine a recruiter. A, rec a recruiter can lie about the reasons for not accepting a candidate, yeah. while a model, a machine learning model, we would know if it, if it's biased or not. Uh, once we put our hands or we pointed fingers to the biases factor, we would know why this person was not hired. So a machine wouldn't lear, wouldn't lie. Mm. So there are opportunities for changing the the the, uh, the facts that we have right now and for making uh, the world a better place <laughs> with the <laughs> with the models that we're building if we point out those bias factors and we 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 um, take it into consideration all the way while we're building the the, the models both till um, the point where we start collecting data and uh, uh, make it uh, as inclusive as possible and uh, the way we factor in the, the attributes, what we want to take from this data, the features that we're going to include in our mm. models and then who we include in the team, who is going to build So if we have a diverse team, team members will start um, uh, checking on the blind spots of each other, mm. right? Okay. Uh, so who, who built the code, ma uh, the, the, mo the model matters. Uh, what we're building, uh, the, co the, the, the models for matters. And uh, uh, obviously the data matters. Uh, and um, see, I think that's... Uh, Do you think that we're getting to a stage where the philosophical questions behind the use of AI are becoming more prevalent or is becoming more important to answer those questions than we've ever faced before. So for example, mm -hmm. you mentioned like considering who's built the model is important. Yes. No one ever said it's important to know who built, I don't know, Twitter when Twitter was first created. No one needed to know the background of the software engineers for, for Twitter, right? Yeah. Um, and that wasn't a consideration. It was just like they're building this software that does stuff. But now... But now there is a move towards uh, defining like those biases in the models that we're using. Since big decisions are being taken from, tho from, th from those predictive models, mm. like the, like the, the, the sentencing, uh, the, compass, uh, the mm. compass model, or the recruitment, the recruitment models, or the, the hiring process that we're trying to introduce. Mm. So these are big decisions that uh, uh, we need to, to flag those factors in. Uh, there, there are tools that are already there that uh, um, that can like and the ones that can help you to like the IBM the, the and the Intel tools that are there for identifying bias in the statistics. I, I, I can't remember the tool name, but there was a TEDx lady that uh, presented. Oh, you mean the the, uh, the algorithmic. Uh, Justice League. Yes, that's the one. Well done. Yeah, the algorithmic yeah, yeah. Justice League, where you can report or you can you can uh, submit your model to be tested by community. Check that it's uh, there is no ethnic bias in there. There is mm. no gender bias. The uh, that uh, it it works well on all. Uh, it, it is inclusive. It includes the. the, the, the I, I think that those measures are really really valuable actually I think the yeah. ideas like the, the the algorithmic justice league I think it's called that or the AI justice league 
I think that those algorithm. having those things available to us are very important yeah. um, because they allow us. There's so many things that we don't recognise mm. that we're we're biased to. Like for example, you're in my team, and therefore if anyone comes and starts to try, I don't know, creating a problem, uh, or if there's for whatever reason, you know, you're they're they're trying to poach you away. I'm going to, I will, because you were close to me, because we are in proximity with each other and because I value you and I've got to know you over the last however long it's been, I will intrinsic, I will overvalue you because we're on the same team, right? Just like I will overvalue my house or my car compared to what the market will value it as. So sometimes we just can't see the biases. Yes. So having yeah, those conscious, yeah. Exactly, right? So having those opportunities to go to a third party who can then come back to you and say, Okay, hey, you got an issue here, um, and they can flag it up for you, having that kind of oversight almost, it's not exactly oversight because there's no legal ramifications to it, but having that kind of uh, 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 having the option of having that kind of oversight, I think is in incredibly valuable in ensuring that we take the right kind of direction across the ethical AI conversation. Yeah, I totally agree. Even reporting, having the option to report some models, mm. even it just satisfies you that you can report, you can report on, uh, uh, on something that's built and it's not inclusive enough. The, the algorithm of Justice League do that as mm. well. That's great. So, yeah. Very good. Um, All right, let's move along. Um, all right, so we've talked about the technology companies. We've talked about the the eBay example, um, and we've talked a little bit about the the bias in machine learning and some of the consequences of that. Uh, especially with the the compass example, I think that's a really strong example, uh, and some approaches to avoid it. So why don't we have a look at some of the the, the comments, uh, Himesh? Thank you for being so active, brother. Um, so one of your points is if these biases have helped to survive as human beings or as a business, why is it considered bad now that we have AI? Do you want to start? Sorry, can you repeat the question? So the question is if these biases have helped to survive as human beings or as businesses, why is it now considered bad? Because it's affecting, it's affecting how the the workspace is now is divided, and it's not it's not necessarily that it uh, it supported us or it secured us. Uh, it is the right thing, right? And bias, because there are different type of bias. There are different type of cognitive bias. So it's uh, we were born biased, yes, but to some extent we need to to fight what's. Uh, uh, what we what we what were born with, with to just to to have a fair a fair decisions fair society. Yeah, I I, th I think I agree. I think that it's important for us to become fairer. I don't know what the answer is, and I think again we were just talking about the kind of philosophical side of AI and how there are so many questions now that kind of we've we've had some of the great thinkers of history kind of ponder on some of these questions uh, without necessarily coming up with like an answer, just kind of leaving it as, oh, well, it's one of those philosophical, there's no right answer questions. Um, and we're, we're now moving to a stage where it's not acceptable to not have a position, whether it's a right one or a wrong one remains to be seen. Um, but like the, the, the self-driving car, question is uh, certainly from a philosophical perspective, right? So if, if there's an accident where a self-car, self-driving, or if there's a situation where a self-driving car is faced going straight, the driver or the owner of the vehicle or the passengers of the vehicle survive, but, the but in front of them are pedestrians and they hit one pedestrian and kill one pedestrian, should the car choose to do that or should the which will likely put the passengers at great risk and peril or should it do something else which is also going to kind of bystanders um, and historically those kinds of questions we didn't have to have an answer to 
But now, because we're kind of pre-programming these machines to decide on an action to take, now we're, we're kind of being presented with these very challenging philosophical questions. Um, there are some important lessons that we can learn from our biases. We do have kind of an obligation to try and remove, you know, especially things like you know, recruitment uh, or the creed, colour, race, uh, language, things like that which are wrong. Sorry, I knew that was going to come out eventually. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I, but because they've existed for so long, then maybe we don't need to uh, don't need to deal with it. Um, there are biases or, or actions which are taken based on some bias or prejudice, which they serve as very obvious example. Something that's not right, less clear. They're more subtle. We can address these things. I mean, a prejudice thing. Um, sorry about that. Anyway, what's next? Uh, AI algorithms, which would only be a superficial fix. Look, it's definitely we have an obligation as human beings, right? We have an obligation as human beings who are living in a period of time where there's great change upon us. Um, I feel like we have an opportunity and an obligation to consider how we might improve things instead of allowing the status quo to continue. Um, the the AI algorithms are a tool that should allow us to make change very quickly, right? Yeah, well, it's a double-sided tool. Absolutely. <laughs> right? Uh, because if, if we're not aware of the biases that can creep into the models while, bring it, while building it, and they are used in some important decisions like hiring, uh, prison t sentencing or even if you're gonna take this loan or not if you're gonna get mm. this insurance or not then um, yeah, yeah <laughs> we're in a big, big trouble yeah. well this this yeah I mean yeah definitely okay um, Shabazz you're asking if we can completely rely on AI without human involvement I don't think anyone would suggest that we're in a it's also I mean that <laughs> You know what, dude? We get that question quite a lot. In fact, we get a lot of people who assume that what we're doing is trying to replace the role of a recruiter. And it's absolutely not designed to be that. It's supposed to be a, like a crutch or an aid to help recruiters screen through more candidates more, more quickly yes. with more insight into those individuals uh, beyond just kind of two pages of, of, of paper. Of right? Right, and, and also to, uh, to avoid the, the, the early on unconscious bias that a recruiter can have while exactly. shortlisting the exactly. candidates. But that's it. So, and then it's, uh, but we face this question all the time about is AI, is AI, I mean, I had it last night and I had it today as well, is AI going to replace you know, humans or human involvement or, or, or whatever it might be in that kind of, in that kind of vein, right? And I, I, f I find it ridiculous. You know, I, I can't imagine. Um, I can't imagine anyone turning around and saying, you know, uh, oh, so you have a team, so now you should just completely rely on your team to do everything, and you don't have to do anything. Mm. That's nuts. No one ever says that. No one ever said, oh, well, I've got a team, and I can rely on them for everything. I don't mm. have to do anything now. The only people that do that are kids. Right? My kids are the only ones that implicitly rely on me without any involvement of their own. Mm. You know? And the same for any parent who has kids, they will recognise that. But after you kind of come of age and you develop consciousness and like, become properly kind of an adult, you don't just rely on one specific thing or on one specific person. You take matters into your own hands and you control the things that you are able to control. Uh, I would encourage everyone to consider that. Um, I would encourage everyone to consider that the, the role of AI, especially in the kind of stage that it's at at the moment, isn't to replace anything. It's to make us better at identifying things, make us better at spotting things, uh, which we're not necessarily good at recognizing because we haven't evolved to be. Cool. So um, do you want to talk about the approaches that we take? Yeah, sure. Uh, Sure. To so avoid having those biases in our models. Sure. So what are we doing? 
So we have a pretty diverse team. How many nationalities do we have in yeah, the office? We have a lot. I think we've got 16. We're, we're 16 members and how many nationalities? Like 16. 16, <laughs> yes. So uh, yeah. every, every yeah. one of us is from a different yeah. place so from all around the world. That's, that's a really interesting thing, right? Because we are lots and lots of different nationalities and uh, our gender split leans more towards females than it does to males. So that we, I think it's pretty close to 50-50. It's like 55-45 yeah. or something like that. Um, but still, this diversity thing continues um, regardless of the fact that on paper we have you know, great gender split, great diversity on age as well. We've got 20-year-olds or 20-something-year-olds through to 40-something-year-olds. Um, and, and people from all over the world, all these different countries with different upbringings and blah, blah, blah. But then there's the, the mindset differences which also play into how we're trying to tackle this, this kind of approach to, or how we're trying to position our approach to, to bias and machine learning. Um, so there's definitely on the, on the people side, we're definitely tackling it head on from that perspective. Um, what else do you think that we're doing? I think we're privileged to be here in Dubai with uh, with people uh, from different cultures, and uh, we're collecting this data from people all around the world. Mm. So our data is pretty diverse as well. Yeah, I would right? agree with that. I think that we have a nicely diverse data set. Yes, and not only that, the labelers who label our data are diverse as well. Yeah. So, uh, so the different perspective of people from different parts of the world that are labeling people from different parts of the world mm. as well. So this is That's interesting. a good point as well. And also, right. I think the fact that we're having more than one person or multiple people labeling information and then we're trying to average out so as that we reduce any issues in terms of kind of outliers. Um, I also think that that's quite an effective step that we've taken too. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, what else do we do? What else do we do? We get people who don't know anything to talk to us. Well, we have a lot of people who are involved in some of the testing process that know nothing. They know nothing yeah. about any of the complexity. They're very lay people. Um, and gathering feedback from those people helps us to ensure that we're not kind of overthinking or shooting in a very weird direction. Um, I think getting that feedback is, is very important, uh, very important to identify if we've missed something. Yes, and actually we are not just labeling our data for personality traits, which is our main model. We are labeling our data for gender, uh, for, for gender, ethnic group, age groups, not, not, to, not for any reason, just to sample, correctly sample our data while, yeah. while building our models just to make sure that our data is inclusive of all those um, type Different of biases groups. that can... that can Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the features that we're extracting from the videos are yep. interesting as well. Tell me uh, about that. So we are extracting the, the, the speech features. We are, uh, we are not taking into consideration the words that are being used, just the tone of voice, the frequency of the voice, is, is what is taken into consideration. Uh, the energy in the voice, mm -hmm. how a person is enthusiastic while, while, while talking and while performing the interview. Uh, and then going into the visual side, um, extracting the action units. And these are the main features that are taken into consideration while building the personality traits as along with the, with the, with the speech features. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, um, yeah, excluding, excluding gender, excluding the, uh, excluding the words, excluding... Well, we have this goal, I know you don't, you're not convinced with, uh, with kind of talking about it at the moment, but we do have this goal of, uh, we define as, or describe as looking past the pixel. Um, it's something that we're, we're, it's still early days in terms of getting us to that point, but I think it's a, it's a very noble goal to have. So the idea, the concept of, of looking past the pixel is that it doesn't really matter the, the color or the density or, or the whatever. the shape of the face. Right? None right. of that stuff matters. I think it's a very noble concept. 
um, that we need to we need to continue exploring and we need to allow that to govern us. Mm. Uh, I think we need to do a lot of that as we continue going forwards. Um, what else? So that's for the main points that are on top of my head right now. I'm trying to think what uh, else we do. I think we extract a lot of feedback from from clients, um, which helps us uh, helps us quite a lot. But it's also a bit of an issue as well because you end up with a situation where if a client kind of performs some analysis on their own team and they have a, a, an opinion of their team which is based off of I don't know very little interaction with them. They don't really know them. Maybe they and then value you don't their they value their they team members, them. right? They over, they they could value them. They could mm. overvalue them. They could have an opinion which isn't based in reality or isn't grounded in reality, or they could have an opinion which is led by the person behaving a certain when, way when they're around that team leader. Um, and then sometimes we have issues where our analysis conflicts, <laughs> conflicts quite aggressively with, uh, with what the perception is. Um, and it is a challenge to be able to, to kind of teach people to look at it slightly differently uh, and to consider why they might be wrong. Not obviously, obviously we're not saying that we're 100% right. And our goal is not to be 100% cor correct. Our goal is to be significantly better than people are right now at being able to do one specific job, which is identify behavior um, from, from a short period of, of video and, and information. Um, but it is a challenge, uh, nonetheless, to, to be able to communicate to somebody that they might not necessarily be grasping all of the relevant information from the person that they're speaking with or that they think they know. Mm. Yeah, so that's I another agree. thing. Cool. Yeah. Okay, cool. I think that that's it for us uh, for today, guys. Um, but I've got some, some cool stuff happening next week. Uh, Psycho's going to be back. She's in the US at the moment uh, in, in Silicon Valley, which she seems to be enjoying a little bit too much. Um, she's, she's going to meet Snoop Doggy Dog in the next couple of days. I think it might even be today. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's cool, right? Um, so she's going to go and meet Snoop Dogg, uh, and, and then she will be back next week. And on Tuesday, she's going to be, I believe, with a, a, a very cool lady called Sara Almadani, uh, and they're going to take you through the stuff that we're doing, how our interview process works, and some of the insights that we can provide to you, um, which might help you either with your recruitment process or understanding a little bit more about yourself as an individual as well. Um, so tune in next week if you're interested in that session. I think that it will be very, very valuable for people to understand kind of how this stuff works and what insights you can get from it. So thank you very much and we will see you next time.